Up next, prepare to be bowled over by these British-made bowls. People have been playing bowls for centuries. And there's one Scottish company that's been making the bowls for the sport since before the rules were even written. First established in 1796, Thomas Taylor Bowls was run by generation after generation of the Taylor family for 196 years. These days, the business is run by Grant Heron and his sister Vicky. But the company is still making bowls for indoor and outdoor use here in Glasgow. This is their Vector VS Bowl in a rather eye-catching iced lime shade. It's the best-selling indoor bowl in the UK because it's perfect for running on fast surfaces. Its speed means this ball is favoured by front-end bowlers. That is, the first or second bowler on a team of four. These coloured balls are still a recent innovation. Black and brown bowls rule the greens for years. Even the modern plastic designs were based on the dark wood of the lignum vitae tree, which has been used for centuries. But with the dawn of a new century, there was an appetite for something more daring. And in 1998, Taylors launched their first coloured bowls. These days, 80% of what we make is now colours. 95% of our export market is all colour now. But there are still dwindling pockets of hardball classic bowlers here at home. The UK still has a bit of a traditional element that once black and brown sales dissipated that much that we don't even offer it anymore. Coloured or classic black, every bowl starts with a delivery of powdered plastic. So this is where uh, the material comes in from our supplier, which is down in St Helens. Um, these guys manufacture the powder for all the manufacturers of bowling balls around the world. So there is only four of us, but these guys do all of it. The coloured balls are made primarily of malamine, a hard-wearing material also used in kitchen worktops. For the coloured bowling balls, different ratios of malamine powders are churned in this rotating mixer, which originally had a slightly different use. Like most things in life, there's no unique ideas. This actually came from a bakery that shut down, it was actually a dough mixer. Um, we used to actually use a traditional concrete mixer, just a big round drum, but that's actually quite inefficient. And if you cycle it too long, the speckle begins to separate again, whereas this being called a Y mixer, it doesn't have that effect. Once the mixer completes its cycle, the tiny grains of color will be evenly mixed to create an attractive speckle pattern in the finished bowl. The iced lime colour is made up of two parts grey, one part sky blue and one part lime green. About 1,800 grams of the coloured mix will be used to create each bowl. So after we've mixed the powder, uh, it comes into this department, uh, it's a moulding department. And what we do now is we take uh, the mixed material and we weigh it out depending on what size of casting or blank we're going to make. This bowl will be a size four which, when finished, will weigh more than 1,500 grams. Players select their bowls based on size and weight, and this is one of the largest sizes that the firm makes. Then goes into this little machine at the side here. It's called an RF preheater. Basically, in layman's terms, similar to a microwave, but it uses RF radio frequency waves instead of microwaves. In there for our five minutes. After five minutes, the consistency of the plastic pellets changes dramatically. So we've already got up to a certain temperature where it's started to bond together. And then Jamie here will squeeze it into a more elongated shape. This shape fits better into the press, which will squeeze it into a tightly packed sphere. So that's it, edit with 150 tonnes worth of pressure right now. The tool containing the mixture heats up to about 135 degrees Celsius and the excess plastic is squeezed out between the sides of the mould, ensuring that no air bubbles form. Um, it will then sit and idle for 10 minutes on colour, uh, at 50 tonnes worth of pressure, and the whole thing will cure. The problem that you have with curing such a thick part, because bear in mind these can be up to 
132 millimetres in thickness, wall thickness, is getting the whole thing to cure homogeneously. If you cured one bit faster than the other, you'd end up with a slight fracture that potentially later in life the bowl could split. The excess plastic, known as the flash, is removed. The bowl will need a full 12 hours to slowly cool and cure completely, by which time they'll have shrunk by just over 1% and are now ready to be shaped. At this stage, we start the machining of the bowls. In this case, we're making a vector, which is for the UK indoor market. Kevin here is going to put one in. It's going to take the flash line off, which is where the male and the female part of the moulding tool have met. So we take that off and then we machine the bias on. Spinning at 4,000 revs per minute, this machine makes short work of shaving the solid plastic sphere down to the correct size, creating the bowl's bias. All bowls have a bias side, which means that one side is more rounded than the other. This uneven design forces the ball to travel along a curved line rather than a straight one. That's it. So well, that's 90% of the bias has now been done, but the ball's got slightly more of an egg shape to that side, and that side's a bit flatter. So if you throw it, this one will roll that way. Um, from this point on now, the bias is pretty much fixed. We now put the grips on, and then we machine the ends off. The grips are a pattern that is machined onto the surface of the bowl to make it easier to hold. The patterns come in different styles to suit different bowlers. This design is a series of 30 holes drilled around each end, and it's known as a pro grip. Next, the bowl is further machined to remove and smooth the ends. The next part of the process after we have put the grips on is we take the ends off. It's gone basically into a vacuum cup. It's held in by suction. Tool comes in, takes this pin off. Then it shapes the ends and then it puts any cosmetic rings on. Then we've got a stop in the program. that The operator will take the bowl out, turn it round, do the same again, and then out. Rather than the standard cutting tools, this company have opted for an expensive addition to their toolbox. We don't use standard uh, tooling equipment. What we use is diamond tools, which somebody who does engineering would think that's a bit overkill for manufacturing plastic objects. But the thing is, when you actually machine this stuff, it's quite abrasive, and your standard um, metal cutting tools would wear out in about 60 bowls. There's average life for a diamond tip in here is about three years. The company say that they make the most accurate bowls in the world, so, Let's see if they live up to their claim. After we finish uh, the machining, um, we have to test every single bowl that we make. Dennis here is going to run them for me. All bowls must travel along the same path as the black master bowl. A master bowl is basically a reference bowl that all manufacturers use to test against new and existing models. When competing, players must use the set of matching bowls that are marked to show they've been tested against the master bowl. Once they've been tested, each set of four bowls is put through three stages of polishing. Once we finish machining them, it's very difficult to feel, but they're, they're not perfectly polished yet. The first polisher removes any sharp edges by agitating the bowls in a rotating drum filled with silicone cones. Now, this is a vibratory polisher. It's actually mainly used in the jewellery industry for polishing small metal parts. The bowls are sold as matching sets of four, and between 15 and 18 sets are polished at a time. They get thrown in there, a bit of water, a bit of detergent, in there for 45 minutes, and it just starts taking all the slight machining imperfections off the top before we then go into stage two in the polishing process. Next, the bowls move on to the second stage of polishing, which, confusingly, is called the six-stage polish, because six different polishing processes are happening simultaneously. The polish isn't necessary for the bowl's performance, but it makes them look and feel better. The bowlers can use a wax on a polished bowl to improve their grip. After one final polish, the bowl is made ready to be engraved. This is just the final stage polish that we're doing here. It's just to give a final luster.
Bowlers can select a ready-made bowl from the company's collection or have one custom designed, including the emblem. We have a library of about 5,000 emblems. So at the moment, I think Joe here is going to be doing a set of vector for the UK market. In this case, we're putting, was it a hawk's head on it, Joe? An eagle's head. Eagle's head on it. It'll have Thomas Taylor made in Scotland on it. They'll have the World Bowls stamp to say it conforms to their rules. As well as their huge library of existing emblems, the company can engrave custom designs of almost anything. We have had requests to put people's grandchildren, people's children, their favourite dog, their favourite cat. And it's not like we would just do a, a Westie for somebody. They want their own Westie put on there. So they'll come in with a photograph of, of said animal and Joe here will make it up and put it on for them. Next, the carved emblems are painted. So once we finish the engraving, uh, we start the painting process. Now, what Stuart's doing here is puts the bowl in the chuck. It's again, it's a vacuum chuck. Make sure the bowl spins concentrically. And then what he does is just slaps a bunch of paint right over the whole surface of the bowl and then wipes it off. And what is left behind is what has gone into the engraving. Almost like magic, the design appears. And the bowls are now ready the final inspection and polish. Right, so this is the final stage. The bowls have been polished, painted, engraved. Then they come here to John, who's doing the final stage inspection. And what he's doing is, after the paint, they sometimes got smears left on them. So what he's doing is polishing that off and then he's giving them a final inspection just in case they've picked up any damage on the last of their travels around the factory. The factory sells directly to the public and also through distributors around the world. So we export to 78 different countries. That's Australia, he's got stuff there for South Africa, stuff for the UK, Malaysia uh, is one that's coming on stream. We've just had an inquiry from India as well. And Grant's got the tough job of selling his bowling balls around the world. You know, it's hard work when you're there because it's non-stop, but, you know, get out of the miserable like, British weather and go enjoy some sunshine for a change.